Okay, hallelujah. Praise God. We serve a good God. We serve a faithful God, as we're going to see in this particular teaching. So over the next three weeks, I want us to look at uh, three of the books which are known as the post-exilic books. Post-exilic or post-exile. What exactly does that mean? So basically Israel's history between uh, coming out of Egypt and then all the way up to the coming of Christ, you can divide basically up into three categories. You basically have the era of the judges, which is in the early days of the history of Israel. You then have the era of the kings, so basically from King Saul onwards, up until what's known as the Babylonian captivity, when the Jews were taken to Babylon for 70 years for their sin. And then after 70 years, they returned to the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and that's known as the post-exilic era or the post-exile era. So when you have, for example, in the Bible, books like Kings and Chronicles, which are the history covering that period of the kings, you then have certain prophets who prophesied during that time. So when you're reading, for example, Isaiah or Jeremiah, it's important to know the historical background and the historical setting that's taking place during the ministry of those prophets, which you'll find in those books, Kings and Chronicles. However, after the Babylonian captivity, so when the Jews came back from captivity, you then have the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. This is what's taking place during that time. And then the prophets that prophesied during that time of history was Haggai and Zechariah. So again, this is how we must understand the Bible. You must read the books of the prophets in line with the historical setting which is taking place. Now, of course, Haggai is the book we're going to look at today. However, it's important to know the historical context and the historical setting that is taking place at the time of Haggai, which we find in the book of Ezra. So please turn to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. You'll find Ezra in between 2 Chronicles and Nehemiah. So Ezra chapter 1. This is what's taking place during the, the ministry of Haggai, which we're going to look at first. As I said, during the time of Jeremiah, the Jews went into serious sin, pagan practices, child sacrifice, sexual perversion, this kind of thing. And it went on for so long, despite the warnings of Jeremiah and Zephaniah and prophets like this. So eventually God sent the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem. They absolutely burnt Jerusalem to the ground under the Babylonian army, uh, under King Nebuchadnezzar. And that was, of course, because of the sin of the Jewish people. However, after 70 years of exile in Babylon, they were then allowed to return. It was actually prophesied in Isaiah 44 that there's a king by the name of Cyrus who would come and overthrow the Babylonians. So after the Babylonians, we have the Persian Empire. Cyrus was a Persian king. And again, it's all prophesied in Isaiah 44, even by name. Cyrus is actually named 200 years before his birth that he would come and overthrow the Babylonians. So once Cyrus comes to power, once the Babylonian Empire has fallen, Cyrus is then the one who gives the Jews permission to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. He sends them back and enables them to rebuild their temple. So in Ezra chapter 1, in verse 1, we read this. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that would be in 539 B.C., 539 BC is the period in history that we're looking at here. First year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Now, what that's talking about is in Jeremiah chapters 25 and 29, Jeremiah prophesied that it would be a 70-year captivity. The Jews would spend 70 years in captivity in Babylon for their sin, but then after the 70 years, they would return. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth and the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus here is telling the Jews that they are to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the house of God, the temple. 
And this is actually known as the Edict of Cyrus. And this was actually found on a cylinder. They used to write things on cylinders in ancient times. You can actually go to the British Museum in London and see this very edict that he uh, commanded. So Cyrus sends the Jews back and they actually return in waves, just like when they were taken into captivity in waves. They took, you know, Nebuchadnezzar took one wave of Jews, then he came back and took a second wave, and the third wave is finally when Jerusalem was burnt to the ground. So in that same sort of way, the Jews actually returned in waves as well. And in the uh, first wave, there was the leadership, which was under Zerubbabel and Yeshua. So not, not, your, not Yeshua as in Jesus, but another Yeshua. And these were the leaders of Israel at this time. Ezra himself was not in that first wave. He didn't return until the next wave, which we see in Ezra chapter 7. This is when he himself returns to Jerusalem. But this would have been... When, when Ezra returned himself, this would have been in 480, 458 BC. So we're talking 80 years later here in the second wave. So as I said, the leaders of Israel at this time were Zerubbabel and Jeshua. It's important to know who all these characters are because they show up quite a bit in these sections of the Bible. Zerubbabel in Hebrew means seed of confusion. Now, Babel is confusion. And that's where, of course, the Tower of Babel, the story of the Tower of Babel comes from. And it's also where the name Babylon comes from. So the name Babylon is taken from Babel, as in the Tower of Babel. So the way to understand the name Zerubbabel is literally the seed that came out of Babylon, or the seed of Babylon. So Zerah in Hebrew is seed. It's actually the same word for sperm as well. Zerah, it's, it's seed. And Babel would be confusion or Babylon. So it's the seed that came out of Babylon. Now, he was, a, he was the great-grandson of Josiah. You've heard me talk about Josiah before, a king who brought many reforms to Israel. And Zerubbabel was a great-grandson of Josiah. So he would have been the grandson of Jeconiah, who was the son of Josiah. I know that all these kings can be quite confusing, but it's important to understand the line of these kings because it's obviously the line where Jesus came from. Now, Zerubbabel couldn't actually be king of Israel. Why? Because the throne of Israel was lost in the Babylonian captivity because of the sin of the Jewish people. Jeconiah was the last king, or the, or the penultimate king, with second from last. And God actually put a curse on Jeconiah for his sin, which we see in Jeremiah 22, where he says, Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling in Judah any more. So none of the descendants of Jeconiah, he's got another name in the book of Kings, it's uh, Jehoiachin, it's the same person, lots of kings have two names, don't they? So Jeconiah was actually told that he would never have a descendant of his who will reign on the throne of Israel. And that is why Zerubbabel, his grandson, was not able to actually be king of Judah, but instead they had governors. So Zerubbabel was known as the governor of Judah at this point, not a king. And again, it's all because of the curse that, that uh, Jeconiah had put on himself. Now you might say, if Jesus is a descendant of Jeconiah, which he, which he is according to, uh, to Matthew chapter 1 verse 11, Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time that they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shietiel and Shietiel begot Zerubbabel. And then we see later on in that line that he's actually an ancestor of Jesus. How is it that that Jesus, a descendant of Jeconiah, is able to reign on the throne of David when Jeconiah was told that none of his descendants will reign on the throne. Well, God has a way of having things both ways. It's a whole other topic, a whole other sermon, but we'll go into that another time. But basically, this is why Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah and not the king, even though he's a descendant of a king. And of course, Jeshua was the high priest. You often had the king and the priest who were the leaders of Israel. Now, Ezra chapter 2, this is where we see a list of the exiles who returned in that first wave. Ezra chapter 3, they first of all rebuild the altar. Remember, they're going back to rebuild the temple. However, the first thing they build is the altar. So the first thing to resume are the sacrifices. They begin sacrificing at the temple location immediately after they built the altar. And also the foundation was laid as well. So they laid the altar and the foundation. But if we go to Ezra 3, 
verse 12, Ezra chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, but many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid. So what this means is, is that the, the ones who were old enough to remember the previous temple that was destroyed, they saw the foundation for the new temple and were bitterly disappointed. It wasn't like the one back in the day. And we often feel like that quite a lot of times, don't we? Where, you know, it's not as good as the one back in the day, you know. Well, this is how the old people felt. The ones who came back from Babylon, they saw the foundation for the new temple and it was disappointing. It wasn't as good as the previous one. Now, in Ezra chapter 4, this is when we see opposition coming now. Basically, during the time that Israel was in Babylon, in captivity, foreigners had come to the land of Israel. Does that pattern sound familiar, does it? It's what's going on right now today, isn't it? That's right. Not the first time it's happened. So whilst Israel was in captivity in Babylon, there were foreigners who had come to the land of Israel. Now, many of these were Samaritans, because when the northern tribes went into the northern captivity, the Assyrian captivity, they brought Assyrians to the land of Israel, and they made what you call, call a hybrid of Jew and, and, and Assyrian, and they were known as the Samaritans. This is what we see a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, for example. So many of these would have been a hybrid of pagan and Jews. Basically, they didn't get on. That's why the Samaritan woman said, you're a Jew, how can you ask me for a drink? So these foreigners, they write back to the king, who at this point was King Artaxerxes. King Artaxerxes was the king at this point. So they write to the king and say, these Jews have come back and they're rebuilding their temple. So basically they have the work stopped. Because of the opposition, the work ceases. And it says in Ezra chapter 4 in verse 24, if we go to that, Ezra chapter 4 in verse 24, after they wrote to King Artaxerxes, King Artaxerxes then issues a decree which says in Ezra chapter 4, verse 24, Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So that would be about 20 years later, in the year 520 BC. And that is basically where the book of Haggai fits in. We actually see that in Haggai, where we see the second year of the reign of King Darius. So there was a hiatus of about 20 years when the work ceased because of the opposition that they received. Now, Darius here, King Darius, is not the same Darius that we see in the book of Daniel in chapter 5 and 6. That's a different Darius. That's Darius the Mede. The Darius here is Darius the First or Darius the Great. So during that 20-year period where the work of the Lord had ceased, the building of the temple had been put on hold, during that 20 years, the people basically went about their own business. They went about sorting their own lives out and their own houses and their own families and things like this. And they completely lost interest in the work of the Lord. This is what happened in that 20-year gap. They had completely lost interest in the building of the temple. Now, of course, in that first wave of Jews who returned, one of those would have been Haggai. We don't actually have a record that he was in that first wave. However, undoubtedly, the prophet Haggai was one of the ones who returned to Jerusalem in that first wave. And it's at this point that he comes in that we see the purpose of his ministry and the purpose of the book of Haggai as well, which was basically to encourage the Jews to get back working again on the temple. After 20 years of doing nothing, just basically worrying about their own affairs and their own houses and their own families and things like this, the purpose of Haggai's ministry was to get the Jews back working again on the temple after so long. Because at this point, they'd basically lost enthusiasm for it. You know, it was something which they didn't have any enthusiasm for anymore after 20 years of hiatus. If we go to Ezra chapter 5, Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1, this is where we see basically the book of Haggai would take place at this point. Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1, then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, so he's the other prophet who prophesied during that time. The prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Verse 2, so Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. So it was the role of these prophets to get the people moving. 
basically to get them back working again on the house of the Lord. But what we see then in the book of Ezra is that there was more opposition that came. There was a governor by the name of Tataniah, and they basically wrote uh, back and said that the Jews, again, are building the temple once again. But the Jews are saying, no, Cyrus, King Cyrus, all them years ago, he told us to come back here and build this temple. Cyrus is the one who told us to come back and do this. So the Jews told them to look in the archives, look in your records, look in the historical records and see that there will be a decree from Cyrus for us to come back here to our homeland to rebuild the temple. So, of course, they make a search of the records, and they do find, indeed, that it was a decree issued at the year that they said for the Jews to return and rebuild their temple. They found that, that record. So then the king at this point writes back and says that they are allowed to rebuild their temple, and they even offer to pay the expenses as well. So, they, so Darius says, leave the Jews alone to build their temple, despite all the opposition. And then if we go to Ezra chapter 6, in verse 14... So this is the second opposition that they've got. However, Darius has said, leave these Jews alone to do the work that they've said they're going to do. Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. So again, these prophets were there to encourage and to get the Jews back working again. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel. And according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So that would be about 516 BC at this point. So over 20 years, over 20 years later, it actually took to finish that temple because of the hiatus that took place. And of course, this period of history that we just looked at there between Ezra 5 and 6 this is basically elaborated more in the book of Haggai. So please turn now to the book of Haggai. You'll find it in between Zephaniah and Zechariah. Now, it's only two chapters. The book of Haggai is only two chapters and a, a bit of useless information. It's actually the only book which is two chapters. Many books have one chapter. There's many one-chapter books. And there's many chap uh, Bible books which have three chapters. But Haggai is the only one to just have two. So it's only a two-chapter book, but that's a bit of useless information because the chapter divisions weren't added till much later. They weren't part of the original Hebrew canon. Now, the name Haggai in Hebrew is Hagi, Hagi, and it means my feast. Chag is feast. We often hear, you know, the feasts in Hebrew are called Chag Pesach, feast of Passover, Chag Shavuot, feast of weeks, Chag Sukkot, feast of, of tabernacles. So Chag, with the I on the end, Chagi, would be my feast. That is what the name Haggai means. There's actually very little known about Haggai himself and about his life. There's very little that we're told in Scripture about the life of Haggai. All we know is when he prophesied, which would have been 520 BC, and all we know is as well the purpose of his ministry, the purpose of the book of Haggai, which was to get the Jews back working again. So if you found Haggai, we'll go to chapter 1 in verse 1. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius in the sixth month, on the first day of the month. As I said, that is 520 BC, and that is completely consistent with the date we saw in Ezra chapter 4, verse 24. Taking place around chapter 5 and, 20 and 6. The word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So the prophets spoke to the kings. That was the role of the prophets, was to speak to the kings and the priests by God. The prophet was like the middleman, the mouthpiece. And again, I always say this, don't shoot the messenger. We're only telling the people what the Lord has said, aren't we, saints? Hallelujah. Verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says, the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. So people were reluctant to build the temple again. They were reluctant and not very enthusiastic to get back to this work. They kept making excuses. The time has not come. It's not the right time. We often hear people making excuses about evangelism. You know, it's not my calling. It's not my thing. You know, I'm not meant to do this. This isn't my thing. You know, people make excuses. Well, this is the sort of excuses they were making at this time. It's not the right time to build the temple. 
Because during that 20-year period, they become so focused on their own lives. Again, this is a problem that Haggai was facing, is that the people would become so focused on their own affairs and investing in their own lives, rather than the interest in the house of the Lord. They completely lost interest in the work of the Lord at this point. Verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses as this temple lies in ruins? So they were basically building luxury houses. A panelled house would have been considered a luxury house back then. They were, ba they were more interested in building their luxury houses than building the house of the Lord. They were concerned with their own lives, not with the work of the Lord. Verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I do love this term because it appears five times in the book of Haggai. In this short book, the word consider your ways or consider occurs five times. It was obviously a phrase that Haggai liked using. And that's one of the things I love about the Bible is that even though each prophet is speaking the words of God, it doesn't actually negate the personality behind each prophet. If you read Jeremiah and Isaiah, particularly in the Hebrew, you'll see there's two very different personalities behind that. And yet they're both co-equally speaking the words of the Lord. So the Lord actually uses someone's personality and traits in order to get his word across. And we see that with Haggai here. Haggai is kind of like a quite a direct speaker. He just comes straight to the point. Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put in a bag with holes. Anyone else feel like they've got a wallet with holes in it? Everyone does, don't they? This is the problem that the people had, is that it was very tough times. The reason it was very tough times is because they were not focusing on the word of the Lord. And because of that, there were food shortages, people were struggling financially, things like this, and they were still unhappy. Even though they were focusing on their own lives, living in their luxury homes, they were not happy. It's never enough, is it? Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. There it is again. Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. So again, the reason that times were tough is because the people were not interested in the work of the Lord. They were interested in their own lives and their own finances and things like this. Verse 9. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Why did the Lord blow it away? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Because the temple of God, the house of God, was lying in ruins, God was withholding those blessings. He was withholding them blessings from the people because they were not concerned about the work of God. Verse 10. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land, and on the mountains, and on the grain, and on the new wine, and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Notice it says, I withheld it. I withheld the rain. I withheld the fruit. So God here is saying, I am the one who withheld these blessings. I am the one who withheld the rain. I withheld the fruit. So again, the purpose of Haggai's ministry was basically to motivate the people. It was to motivate them to focus their attention once again on the work of the Lord instead of their own interests. It was basically to get the Jews off of their behinds working on the house of the Lord once again, instead of on their own affairs. And that is what God does whenever the work of the Lord is being neglected, whenever the work of the Lord is not getting done, God will always send a Haggai to get the people off their behinds and start working on the work of the Lord instead of their own work. That is what God does. He will always send a Haggai to get the people working again. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheetiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet. 
as the Lord their God sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. So now they're obeying. They're doing exactly what Haggai has told them to do. Verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Notice he's governor there, not king. And the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Now notice verse 14. Who is the appeal to there? Who is now doing the work? It's the remnant, isn't it? It's the remnant of the people who came back. The appeal there is to the remnant. But what does he say in verse 13? I am with you. Whenever people are told to do the work of the Lord, and it's only the remnant who's doing it, God says, I am with you. He will never tell us to do the work of the Lord without being with us. He would always be with us whilst we are carrying out his work. Let's go to chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. There we go. It's the remnant as well who, who he's appealing to. Saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is it not in your eyes as nothing? As we saw in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 12, many people were disappointed with the new temple. Those who were old enough to remember the old temple, Solomon's temple, they saw this new temple and it was a great disappointment. Again, it's that kind of thing that a lot of us have where, oh, it's not like the one back in the day. It's never the same as the one back in the day, is it? So this is exactly how it was. The people who could remember the old temple saw the new one and they were disappointed. And it says in Ezekiel, sorry, in, in Ezra 3.12, as we read, that they were weeping because it was so disappointing. And it's the same nowadays with the church. Remember, the temple is the church, isn't it? Who remembers the former glory of the church? Who among us remembers those times? Well, none of us, because those times are long gone. Who remembers the glory days of Spurgeon and the Wesley brothers and William Booth? Hardly anyone's left alive now to remember those days, because they're long gone. The days where Charles Spurgeon had 6,000 people three times a day coming to listen to him in London. Those days are gone. The old generation now, they're gone, aren't they? People who are left, who remember the glory days of the church, are very few and far between. This is the same sort of thing that's going on now. The people who remember the glory days of the church are very few and far between now. Verse 4. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you. Again, he always tells us when to work, he is also with us. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. So what he's doing there, he's, he's reminding the people, I made an irrevocable covenant with you when you came out of Egypt. And where he says, my spirit remains with you, do not fear, I think the verse he's particularly referring to there would be Deuteronomy 31, in verse 6, which is, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So he's reminding the people there, I made a covenant with you which is irrevocable, despite your sin. I am with you. I will not forsake you. Do not fear. Again, it's Deuteronomy 31, 6. It fits well. Now in verse 6 of chapter 2, Haggai now jumps ahead into the last days. We often see prophets do this in their books. You'll often have the rebuking, but then the future glory of the nation of Israel. And we see this no different in the book of Haggai. Chapter 2, verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, and sea and dry land. I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now that there is actually quoted in the New Testament. We do have a verse from Haggai 
quoted in Hebrews chapter 12. It's this verse right here. Hebrews chapter, verse, chapter 12 in verse 25. It might be worth actually turning to that if you just put your thumb on the Haggai chapter 2, because we'll come back to that, and turn to the book of Hebrews towards the end of your New Testament. And again, it's one of the ways that we know that these books are Holy Spirit inspired because the New Testament writers quoted from them. So Hebrews chapter 12, again, these things have a meaning for the present day, Haggai's present day, but it also has a meaning for the last days. These things always have a future meaning. So remember, in verse 6 he said, Once more I will shake heaven and earth and sea and dry land. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25 it's always a good idea to go to it because then you know exactly what the prophet was getting at. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. There you go, he's quoting Haggai right there. Verse 27, now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. We're going to see what that means. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So notice it says that the shaking there relates to things that fall off and remain. When you shake a tree, for example, a fruit tree, when you give a fruit tree a good shaking, what's going to happen? The rotten fruit is going to fall off and the good fruit is going to remain. We see this, for example, in Revelation. In chapter 6, verse 13, it says, The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its lake figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. So when you shake a tree, the rotten fruit is going to fall off, the bad fruit is going to fall off, and the good fruit is going to remain. Well, the world is going to be shaken once again, according to Haggai. It's going to be shaken one last time. Why? Because there's a lot of rotten fruit to get rid of, isn't there? When God shakes the earth one last time, there's going to be a lot of rotten fruit got rid of. That is why we're going to see things in the tribulation, the mark of the beast and things like this. Why? It's going to weed out the unsaved. It's going to weed out the imposters, isn't it? That's why God does these things. That's why he allows these things. But what can't be shaken? What cannot be shaken? A life which is built upon the rock, Jesus said. Rock, uh, capital R, that is, in Luke 6. Luke 6, verse 47, it says, Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation upon the rock, capital R. Who is the rock? It's Christ, isn't it? Christ is the rock upon which we build. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard it and did nothing is like a man who built the house on earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. When you build your house upon sand, the wind and rain is going to come, wash the sand away, and that house is going to collapse. When you build your house upon the rock, it doesn't matter how much you shake it, it will always stand. If your life is built upon the rock, capital R, then it will not shake. It will not collapse. Now, this church itself has had a good shaking many times, isn't it? And we've seen a lot of rotten fruit fall off in the process. But what remains? The good fruit. The good fruit always remains when it is shaken. That's what Haggai is getting at, according to Hebrews 12. Let's go back to Haggai 2 in verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. All the silver and the gold in the temple is mine, says the Lord of hosts. That is why the Babylonians came under such judgment when the Persians arrived. Because we see, for example, in Daniel chapter 5, 
with Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. They had a big feast. They had a big feast, and they brought out all the vessels of gold and silver that had been stolen from the temple in Jerusalem, and they used them to get drunk. They're profaning the holy items. These items were holy. They were anointed for sacred use. So when God says the silver is mine and the gold is mine, but it's being used for binge drinking, that is why the judgment fell upon the, Bab- upon the Babylonian king. Verse 9, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Now the way this is translated is actually quite difficult to translate from the Hebrew. The better way to translate this would be not the glory of this latter temple, but the latter glory of this temple. The latter glory of this temple will be greater than the former. So what that's referring to is the fact that in the millennial kingdom, there will be a temple. There will be a temple in the millennial kingdom according to Revelation 11 and also according to Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. There is going to be a temple in the millennial kingdom, of course, where Christ will reign from. So the glory of this latter temple will be greater than the former, even though it was disappointing, even though the people who remembered the former one were disappointed, God is saying the glory of this temple will be greater than that of the former. Now, in verse 10, Haggai is now going to refer to some ceremonial laws which are drawn from Leviticus chapters 5 to 7. Again, some of this is kind of difficult to understand, so I'm not going to spend too long going through this, these next few verses. But in verse 10, it says, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, now ask the priest concerning the law, it's asking the priest now, concerning the law, saying, if one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, with the edge he touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? The priest answered, no. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it become unclean? The priest answered, and said it will be unclean. Basically, if you touched dead bodies back then, you were considered unclean. That's from Leviticus 21. We also see that in Numbers 19. If you touched a dead body, you was unclean. What I think this is getting at here, obviously what we're seeing is that holiness is not transferred, but defilement is. If, if something holy touches something, it doesn't become holy. But if something defiled touches something, that becomes defiled. Holiness is transferred, but defilement is not. It's very easy to become defiled, but it's not very easy to become holy. Being holy takes sanctification, perseverance, discipline, self-denial, crucifying one's flesh. That's what it takes to become holy. To become defiled, it takes a bad decision in one second, doesn't it? So that's what I think is getting at here. It's a lot easier to become defiled than it is to become holy. It took 20 years for Babylon to destroy Jerusalem. It took 100 years to rebuild it. It's always easier to destroy than it is to rebuild, isn't it? So I think that's what Haggai is getting at there, is that holiness is not transferred, but defilement is. Verse 14. Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer is unclean. So what he's saying is here, during the time where the temple laid in ruins and they were still sacrificing, don't forget, they were still sacrificing because in Ezra 3, we saw the altar was rebuilt. They were still sacrificing, but they'd lost interest in rebuilding the house of the Lord. They had no interest in rebuilding the house of the Lord. Therefore, their sacrifices were considered unclean. Their sacrifices were not accepted. When you make sacrifices to God in the wrong attitude or with the wrong motives, he doesn't accept them. When you give to God with the wrong motive, or when you, begin, when you give begrudgingly, he doesn't accept it. He doesn't want gifts that are given begrudgingly. And that's why it says on our nice wooden box over here, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not begrudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So anything you give to the Lord, whether it's finances, whether it's time, whether it's service, whatever it is, must be with a cheerful heart. It must never be begrudgingly. If it's begrudgingly, God does not want it. He does not accept it. He only wants people to give with a cheerful heart. That, again, is what Haggai is getting at. Why are you sacrificing to the Lord when this temple lies in ruins? 
Verse 15. And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ifas, but there were 10. When one came to wine vat to draw out 50 baths from the press, but there were 20. He's referring there to the days when there were shortages. He's referring to the days when they struggled because of their lack of interest in the work of the Lord. Verse 17. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, said the Lord. So what God was doing there, he was trying to get the people's attention. Whilst they were too busy doing their own thing, investing in their own lives, God was trying to get their attention by sending famines and mildew and blight and creating these shortages. They came from God. Again, it was said, I was the one who did this because he was trying to get their attention because of their wrong priorities. Again, they weren't doing things that were sinful. It was the wrong priorities that Haggai is contending against here. Verse 18. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it, is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit, but from this day I will bless you. You see that? All those days where they had famines and shortages of food because of their wrong priorities, because they have now obeyed the voice of the Lord, because they are now shifting their interests from their own lives to the work of God, God is saying, from this day forth, I will now bless you. That is when the blessings come, isn't it? When our priorities are correct. A lot of people are not being blessed because of wrong priorities, just as the, just as the Jews of this day. They're now obeying the voice of the Lord because they've got their priorities right. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6, in verse 33? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. You don't get these things added to you and then seek the kingdom of God. It's seek first the kingdom of God, then these things will be added unto you. The reason that they were having shortages and famines is because they were not seeking the kingdom of God. They were not doing the work of the Lord. They were interested in their own lives and their own houses. Now that they've obeyed the Lord, now that their priorities have shifted back to rebuilding the temple, God is saying, I will now bless you because their priorities were now aligned with him. Seek first the kingdom of God, then these things will be added unto you. In verse 20, he now jumps back out to the last days again. You need to kind of see where Haggai is prophesying, whether it's for his own time, whether it's for the last days, or whether it's a combination of both. Verse 20. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. Again, re repetition of the same prophecy there. I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride on them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. Now, of course, that has a literal meaning for Haggai's time because we saw, for example, the Babylonians were destroyed by the Persians. After the Persians, the Greeks under Alexander the Great are going to come and conquer them as well. But also it says, I will destroy the strength of Gentile kingdoms. That's referring to the last days when Jesus Christ returns to destroy every worldly kingdom. We see this in Daniel chapter 2 with the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Each layer in that statue represents an empire, doesn't it? What happens? The stone comes along. Well, who's the rock? It's Jesus, isn't it? The stone comes along and smashes that statue to pieces. It's a picture of when Jesus Christ is going to return to destroy every worldly kingdom. That is what Haggai is prophesying there. And we see that fulfillment in Revelation 11, in verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We saw this verse at our Bible study on Thursday, didn't we? Verse 23. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, and says the Lord, I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Now the signet ring is very significant because that has to do with authority. A king would have a signet ring who he would give to someone to act on his behalf and he would have the full authority of the king. 
So, for example, in the book of Esther, we're going to see in Purim in a couple of months, the king gave Haman his signet ring because Haman said, there's these people there who don't obey your laws. They have different customs. We need to get rid of them. We need to wipe them out. The king gave Haman the signet ring and said, do with these people as you please. He's giving Haman full authority. That signet ring was a symbol of authority. And, of course, we see that as well in the parable of the lost son in Luke 15, where the son returns and he says, put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, things like this. In Jeremiah 22, we spoke about Jeconiah, how he had a curse put upon him because of his sin. In Jeremiah 22, verse 24, it says, Though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet ring of my right hand, yet I will tear you off. So the king is the signet ring. But God is saying, I'm going to tear you off my right hand because of your sin. Now, of course, any king foreshadows Jesus, doesn't he? Any king foreshadows Jesus, who has been given full authority by the Father. So Jesus is the signet ring of the Father's right hand. Because it says in Matthew 28, in verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's what Jesus said. And in Acts 17, verse 31, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained. He has given him assurance of this by raising him from the dead. So Jesus is the one who has been chosen and ordained to be the judge of the world. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. But notice with Zerubbabel, it says, I'll make you like a signet ring. A lot of people miss that, that word there. I'll make you like a signet ring. Why is it like a signet ring? Because he couldn't be king. Because he was a descendant of Jeconiah who was cursed. He had a curse put on him because of his sin. Zerubbabel was not the king of Judah. He was the governor. But he still says, I have chosen you. I have chosen you to be the one to lead the nation of Israel at this point in history. I have chosen you to be the one to lead the rebuilding of the temple. I'll make you like a signet ring. That is the meaning there of the signet ring. So that is what the book of Haggai is all about. It's about the rebuilding of God's house that lied in ruins. And it's about the priorities of putting that first. Putting God's work first. Putting the interests of God first over our own interests. That is what the book of Haggai is all about. Now, don't forget, Haggai was not contending with sin, necessarily. It wasn't necessarily wrong things that people were doing. It was wrong priorities. That is what kind of makes Haggai a little bit different to the rest of the prophets, like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Joel and people like this. They were contending with the sin of the people. Haggai wasn't necessarily contending with sin. It was wrong priorities not doing the work of the Lord, neglecting the building of the house of God. And what is the house of God now? Seven times the New Testament calls the temple the church. The church is the house of God. Not a building, but the people. The gathering of the people is the church. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, aren't we? It says in 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Peter 2 verse 4 says, Coming to him, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are the stones of the temple. We are what make the temple of God. Only what's the problem today? Just like then, the house of God lies in ruins. The church lies in ruins today, doesn't it? We are seeing unprecedented apostasy in the church today. It is lying in utter ruins. Do you know how many churches now are closing because they can't get more than five people through their doors on a Sunday? About one church a week closes in this country. Many of them are becoming mosques now. The church is lying in ruins. The house of God is lying in ruins. Whilst people are interested in their own lives and their own affairs, and their own luxury houses, their own finances. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24 that the last days will look like? Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know that the flood came and took them away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Again, it's not talking about things that are necessarily wrong. 
It's talking about people who had no interest in the work of the Lord or the house of the Lord. They were interested in their own lives and their own affairs. And what's the result? What was the result of the people there neglecting the work of the house of the Lord? Shortages, famines, tough times. What's the result now? Shortages, famines, tough times. People are struggling financially. People are going through tough times right now. Why? Because the church lies in ruins. The house of God lies in ruins whilst you all run to your luxury houses, as it says in Haggai. But whenever the work of the Lord is not being done, whenever the work of the Lord is deprioritized in favor of one's own affairs, God will always send a Haggai to get the people moving. God will always send a prophet Haggai to get the people off their chairs doing the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. The temple lies in ruins. The house of God lies in ruins. And who is it down to to rebuild it? The remnant. It's down to the remnant to rebuild the ruined house of God. Who is the remnant? It's you and I, brothers and sisters. We are the remnant who are going to rebuild the house of God. It's down to you and I to rebuild this ruined temple. Now, of course, times are tough right now. People are struggling. Everything's going up in price. Except salvation. It's still free. It's the only thing that hasn't gone up. Salvation is still free. But doing the work of the Lord isn't free. Doing the work of the Lord is not free. It involves cost. It involves sacrifice. It involves self-denial. But what happens when you prioritize the work of the Lord? What happens when you prioritize the interests of God over your own interest and your own finances? That's when the blessings come. It's when the blessings came, when the Jews of this time turned around and said, we are going to obey the voice of Haggai and the voice of the Lord. And they built the temple. They got back interested in the work of the Lord once again. That's when God said, from this day, I will bless you. When you make a decision to actually prioritize the work of the Lord over your own interests and your own finances, that is when God says to you, from this day, I will bless you. When you are prioritizing the work of the Lord again, it is not sinful to build a luxury home. It is not sinful to build a family. It is not sinful to save money. But when you're prioritizing that over the work of God's house, whilst it lies in ruins, that is when God sends a Haggai to get you working on the house of the Lord once again. Because it is down to the remnant to rebuild it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can be a multimillionaire one day, and you can be broke the next. Because what happens when thieves come in and steal? What happens when the banks crash and all your money's gone? What happens then? You've got multimillionaires running around who are still depressed and suicidal. Can you imagine that? People who have cars and houses and everything they could ever want, and they are suicidal. Why? Because they know that they are still depressed even though they have all this money and everything they could ever ask for. When you have all that and you're still depressed, what's the point? That's why they're suicidal. This isn't making me happy. What will? That's why we see people who are rich and blessed but still depressed and still not happy because they are storing up treasures where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal when you store up treasures in heaven no one can get at that thieves cannot break in and steal that moth and rust cannot destroy that and that again is the whole point of Haggai's ministry was for people to invest treasures in heaven not on earth Colossians 3 1 if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Our temporary lives cannot take priority over the work of God because our real life is in heaven, hidden with Christ in God. That is where our real life is. It's where our real citizenship lies, isn't it? We have temporary lives here on earth, but all the things that we accumulate here, all the savings, all the houses, all the interests that we have on here on earth, it's all going to burn. It's all going to burn and you can't take it with you. You came into the world with nothing and you're going to leave with nothing. 
However, when you get to heaven, there you'll have treasures waiting for you. You'll have rewards waiting for you. It talks a lot about rewards in the Bible, doesn't it? Do not confuse rewards and salvation. Again, salvation is free. Doing the work of the Lord is not free. It involves cost. It involves sacrifice. But when you make those sacrifices, when you actually prioritize the work of the Lord in your life, that's when God says, from this day forth, I will bless you. Hallelujah. Our temporary lives cannot take priority over the work of the Lord. And that is why we are so blessed here at CFM Essex to have so many committed saints who are interested in the work of the Lord, rebuilding the ruined house of the Lord. Again, the church, unprecedented levels of apostasy we're seeing now. The churches are now marrying sodomites ordaining transvestite priests, ecumenical movement. We've got to unite with Islam and with Jehovah's Witnesses. That is what the church is like today. You go to church, all you hear about is pronouns and climate change. That is what the church is like now. It lies in ruins. That's why they're closing. That's why they can't get more than five people through their doors on a Sunday. Who's it down to to rebuild the temple? The remnant. And that's you and I, brothers and sisters. We are very blessed to have so many saints in this church who are committed to rebuilding the house of God. And I praise God for that. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this day and we thank you for this gathering. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together. And we thank you just for this important lesson that we see in this short book in, in your word, the book of Haggai. We thank you for his message and we thank you for his ministry. We thank you, Lord, that the example that we see here of wrong priorities shifting into right priorities is a door for blessings to come in, Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that when we prioritize you, you then choose to bless us, Lord, even though you don't owe us anything, even though you don't need to bless us, Lord, you still choose to pour out blessings in our lives. And Lord, help us to be focused on the rebuilding of the house of God, which lies in ruins. Help us to not be consumed with our own lives and our own interests, but help us, Lord, to focus on what it is you want us to do for your kingdom, not for this kingdom, but for your kingdom, Lord. Help us to unite as a church, Lord, to rebuild the ruined house of God. Help us to get our priorities right. And we thank you, Lord, that when we do that, you still choose to bless us even though you have already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You've already given us so much more than what we deserve simply by sending your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for our sin. We thank you for that greatest blessing of all time, which can never be matched. We thank you for the blessing of eternal life and salvation. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not destroy and thieves do not break in and enter and steal. We thank you, Lord, that we serve a faithful God, a faithful God even when we are unfaithful. And help us to continue building the house of God. Help us to continue doing your work. Help us to continue giving to you, Lord. Help us to continue serving you and offering up spiritual sacrifices to you, Lord, which are pleasing and acceptable through Jesus Christ. And we give you praise and thanks, Lord, for the truth of this word that we've heard today. That your word is all truth. There is no error in your word. And we thank you for he himself who is the word, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank you.